Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Gray Methodist Church. My name is Melissa Westbrook, and I am the choir director here at the traditional service and also one of the worship leaders at um, the 11 a.m. service. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us on this Christmas Eve Sunday morning. So I'd like to take this opportunity to um, just let everybody know how thankful we are that you chose to spend this morning with us. And whether you're here in person or you're online, please know that we are honored that you chose to spend your morning with us celebrating the birth of Jesus and the light of the world. So we're going to start our morning off with singing a couple traditional hymnal songs. And so if you will, underneath your seats, there are plenty of hymnals you might need to share with people beside you. Um, but there will also be words on the screen. Our first hymn that we're going to sing is on page 240, page 240, and it's going to be Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, and we'll sing all three verses. So please stand and join us as we sing. be seated. I'm going to invite Gabe up for a couple of announcements. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for showing up this Christmas Eve service and making worship a priority. Um, I'm very happy to see everybody here, uh, Christmas Eve services, and even tonight, the candlelight service we'll have at 6 p.m. Those are some of my favorite times of the year to be in the church, so I'm really happy to see everyone here. Um, and then on top of that, um, I've been praying and thinking a lot about um, what all I wanted to talk about this morning, even in this brief amount of time that I have up on, on stage with you guys. But uh, as I sit back and I think about um, just how blessed we are to have God recognize our need for a Savior um, and who his son is and how, um, how he came down to earth and made himself flesh for us. Um, I think it's very exciting that we get to celebrate that, but also um, I pray and hope that as we move forward um, after today and tomorrow that it wouldn't just be a recognition of Christ and his birth, but that we would also focus on him and who he was in his life, right? Because it says the word became flesh. So all of you guys with your Bibles here this morning, we have him with us, right? We serve a living God. 
So I pray that as we continue on throughout this year, that it wouldn't just be a focus and a recognition of his birth, which, again, we should praise and honor him for that today, but also that we would just continue forward and praise and honor him and who he is uh, for the rest of his life and his death and resurrection. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Um, Another thing, like I said, worship is a priority, right? So um, as we look at Luke chapter 2, right, and his birth, and as we just sang about, right, the angels singing, right, there's so much worship and praise for Christ and his birth. And so I I hope that you guys, um, as we continue in worship, would be encouraged to lift up your voices and give him all the praise and honor and glory that he deserves. Um, So like I said, uh, if I haven't introduced myself, my name's Gabe Davidson. I'm the youth director here at Great Methodist Church, and I'm so blessed um, and happy to be able to see everyone here. Um, I have a couple announcements. Um, If you have uh, a bulletin, you can see all of them right here in your hand. Um, And there's also a QR QR code on the bottom left. If you scan that, pretty much any information you could ever need about getting plugged in is right there at your fingertips. Um, Like I said, we have our candlelight service tonight at 6 p.m. Would love to see everyone here. Um, And then also, uh, Youth Has Winter Jam coming up in February. It's on the 10th. It's a Saturday. If you'd like to join, make sure you go and sign up. Um, And then also, communion is something we really prioritize here. Um, It's a a command that we were given um, to do biblically, and uh, we like to serve in that way, and it's a really great and easy way to serve, so if if it's something you'd like to uh, take part in um, in the year coming forward, um, there are sign-ups. If you want to do uh, do that and go ahead and book a day that you want to be a part of that um, you can do that through the QR code or talk to anyone on staff um, but other than that um, I think that's everything I have so if you guys would stand with me as we affirm our faith in the question Christian what do you believe I believe in God the Father all You guys can be seated, and at this time, we're going to invite the Bell family up to light the Advent candles. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, people laden with iniquity, and offspring who do evil, children who deal corruptly, who have forsaken the Lord, who have despised the Holy One of Israel, who are utterly estranged. From the moment we decided to do life on our terms, we rebelled against God Almighty. We are now a people at war, war with God and war with self. But the good news is that in Jesus Christ, we are no longer enemies of God. Jesus repairs what our rebellion broke. Isaiah helps us understand how Jesus made it possible for rebels like us to be welcomed back into God's kingdom. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed.
This morning, we light the candle of peace to remind us that through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. We are no longer his enemies. We are his children through faith in Jesus Christ. As we continue in worship um, this morning, we're going to sing Away in a Manger, and that's going to be in your hymnals on page 217, page 217. So please stand, and um, we're going to sing all of the verses in that one as well. There are three verses, so please join us. Turn in your hymnals to page 245, 245, and we're going to sing the first Noel. It's a little longer, so we're not going to sing all of those verses. Um, so 245, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. So please continue standing and sing with us. may be seated for um, Chase to come up and he's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Good Christmas Eve morning to everybody. I'm Chase Fowler. I'm one of the worship leaders at the 11 o'clock service. Uh, if y'all came prepared to give today, uh, there will be uh, places to give in the boxes uh, beside each exit uh, for those gifts this morning. If y'all would, please bow your head with me as we pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of Christmas. Thank you so much for, for what it means for all of us, Lord. And we, and we thank you so much that you've given us gifts this year, Lord. All the blessings through trials and tribulations and through, through even all of our sin, God, you have blessed us so much this morning. We thank you so much that, that you gave your life, that you came to earth, and that you are our Savior, God. Not only that, that you're coming back again one day, God. We thank you so much for those gifts and for that knowledge that you are who you are and that you've given us your word this morning, Lord. And we thank you so much as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven. Well done. Very well done, guys. Thank you, Melissa. Great to have you back up here as well. 
Y'all look beautiful. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Well, uh, we're going to be sending out kids uh, fifth grade down to three years old for your time of kids worship. So the doors are about to open. Looks like one of Santa's elves is there waiting for you. So you kiddos have a great time. As they're heading out, a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, our candlelight communion service will be here tonight at 6 p.m. If you normally go to the one at Clinton, that's going to be at 5 p.m. I know there was a typo in the email that went out, so don't show up there at 6 for candlelight because there won't be anybody there. I can do three services on Sunday. I can't do two at the exact same time, though. It is physically impossible. So, Larry, we had a cat come in the service at Clinton. It was like the, the Ray Charles song. Not Ray Charles, Ray Stevens. Ray Charles. So, Ray Stevens, yeah. People were jumping up out of the pews. I was like, Lord, the Holy Spirit is here. He, he was, but it was somebody's cat. And y'all know how I feel about cats. So, <laughs> Go ahead and take your, uh, your word, uh, whether you got your, your Bible with you or you got it on your phone, and go ahead and mark Genesis chapter 3. Uh, believe it or not, that is a Christmas story, and that's where we're going to spend a good bit of our time this morning. Um, if you are a guest, uh, we're so grateful to have you here. If you haven't met me, my name is Jason. I am pastor here and also at Clinton uh, down the road. So it's wonderful to be with you guys this morning. Merry Christmas. Merry it's here. How many of you are like, it was just here and now it's here again, right? I feel that a little bit, uh, a little bit every Christmas season. It's usually pretty busy for us. Um, if you haven't been with us, what we've been doing during this season of Advent leading to Christmas is we've been looking at some of the, the classic songs of the Christian faith to help guide us through this season. And what many of us have found by looking at some of these songs is we've been singing them our whole life and we've gotten so familiar with the words that we just go through them. You know how like the Lord's Prayer that if you really don't pay attention, it just becomes a religious repetitive thing? But if you really pay attention to the words, then you're suddenly like, oh my goodness, this, this is the heartbeat of prayer. This is what the Father wants me to be praying about. Well, it's kind of the same thing with these songs. And so each one we've looked at, we've really been able to see something deeper about the gospel and the meaning of Jesus. So we're going to do that this morning. And uh, we're going to sing to close uh, later in the service the, the song we're going to look at. Uh, but the, the song opens with these lines. You know it. Joy to the world. The Lord is come, not has come, not will come. Like he is pouring into our world right now. Let earth receive her king. That's the journey of the Christian life. We talked about this several weeks ago. I shared it in a psalm that's kind of captured my imagination for the year to come. When, when David's talking about that he's just not going to rest until the Lord is on the throne. Until the Lord is seated on the throne. That's the picture here. Let every heart Prepare him room. Do you know how to prepare room for the Holy Spirit in your heart? You've got to dig out the things that block the Holy Spirit. And this is a great time of year to be doing that. If you have sin in your life, you know it's there. And it's intentional sin. You've got to clear that out or you're not going to experience Jesus in a real way. If you have resentment or bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart, then you're not going to experience Jesus in a real way because those things block the Holy Spirit. They're not welcoming to Him. This is one of our times of year where we really focus on preparing the room of our heart for Jesus. And then he finishes that opening line with, heaven and let heaven and nature sing. These words were written by an English minister uh, named Isaac Watts. He took a selfie, thank goodness, or we wouldn't know what he looks like. When you have no hair, you can't critique any hair, but I wouldn't want that hair. It's a wig. Um, he wrote this song in 1719. If you don't know who Isaac Watts is, it's okay. The, really, all you need to know is he is the, the OG of hymn writing. This guy wrote over 750 hymns. Joy to the World, though, is possibly his best known because you don't even have to be a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be consistent in a church, and you still know this song. It's just part of the cultural lexicon at this point. The big thing, though, is we as Christians have been praising Jesus with this song for over 200 years. Speaking of praising Jesus, how many of you want to praise Jesus that the air came on? Amen. Amen. Yeah. This morning, though, we're going to focus on the weird verse in this hymn. You know how like every hymn has a weird verse that you just don't sing? You skip it, right? We're going to, those of us who grew up in church, we know that. 
We're going to focus on the weird verse this morning because the weird verse helps us understand two things. Here, here's, here's what it helps us understand. First of all, why is life, why is your life so filled with anxiety? And the second thing is this, why is Jesus the only one who can truly heal our anxiety? Let's pray. We'll move into this. Gracious Father, I pray that there is no one who came into this room this morning thinking that they have to act a certain way or be a certain way for you to love them. I pray, Father, that every person who came into this room this morning, that they understand that they have to be honest with God and, and with others about what they're feeling and where they're at in life and what they're experiencing. There's nothing sadder than someone coming into an encounter with the living God, because that's what worship is. There's nothing sadder for someone to come into that setting and for them to put on religious airs and for them to act like everything's great in my life and my family. God, I pray that every person that comes into this room, that they know that they are in a safe place to give you all of it, to let you in to all of it. And what I ask, Father, as we look at the words of this hymn and the scripture that it comes from, Jesus, would you please show us that one of the many gifts you want to give to us as your followers is the ability to live a life that isn't ruled by anxiety. Help us to see that in your precious name. Amen. All right, now, verse 3 of Joy to the World is probably not the verse that you're singing in your head when you're walking around singing this song, decorating, putting up your tree, or doing cookies or something like that. Um, if you pay attention to the words, though, verse 3 describes what I think is one of the most important things that Jesus accomplished for me and you through his birth, death, and resurrection. Here's the verse. It'll be on the screen. No more. Let sins and sorrows grow. Sin and sorrow is always together. Amen? Do you understand that? Sin and sorrow is always together. We step into sin because it promises us, oh, it's going to make you feel good, or it's going to give you some peace, or it's going to give you some happiness. And so we give in to that temptation, and does it ever deliver happiness or peace or fulfillment? No, it always produces greater sorrow. So no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And just to make sure you get that, he says it three times, right? He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. So if we're going to unpack this, you know, the obvious thing to address in this verse is the idea of the curse. Because particularly younger generations in our culture right now, um, they're opening up their eyes and they're seeing, no, like everything in our world is jacked up right now. Everything in our world is broken. Nothing works. And I can't really trust anything or anybody. So it's like you get to these younger generations and they really see something's wrong with this world. I'll tell the younger generations, though, guess what? All of us older folks, we know it too. I remember in my teenage years, my early 20s, Man, life was just so optimistic and everything was roses and great and so many opportunities. But the older I've gotten and the more responsibility I've gotten, don't you love that word, grown-ups, right? The older I've gotten and the more responsibility I've gotten, it's just become clear to me, this world does not work the way it's supposed to. Can we at least say amen to that? Okay? That's actually part of the Christmas story and that's what's happening here with this idea of the curse. So what is the curse that Watts is talking about. And why does he describe the curse as thorns infesting the ground? Why does he describe the curse as the, the rampant growth of sins and sorrows, almost like it's an infection in the world? And most importantly, how does the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ undo that curse? So we're going to talk about the curse first. You don't have to raise your hand. But do you ever feel sometimes like your life is just a little cursed? All right? Do you ever have that feeling? You know what that existence means, right? If something can break, okay, if you're new here, we answer. It's kind of what we do. So if something can go wrong, 
if someone can let you down or break your heart, more often than not, things just don't seem to go the way they're supposed to go. Do you ever feel that in your life? Like your life is just somehow cursed to be broken. Say the phrase supposed to for me. Now I'm from deep south Georgia, so we would say supposed to, right? But we just we completely omit several letters there. That's how we roll. But this idea, though, that there is a way that life is supposed to go. How many of you have that idea inside of you? Just raise your hand. I have an idea inside of me of how life is supposed to go. Okay, come on, the rest of you are just drowning in depression and despair. Okay. <laughs> Glad you're here this morning. We have something for you. The, the, what I want you to see is every one of us has a sense inside of us of how life, say it with me, is supposed to go. That's an interesting idea. What is it that causes me and you to think that there is a way that life is supposed to go? What causes us to think that? When things go wrong in our life, what is it that makes us say, this is wrong? And it shouldn't be that way. I would suggest to you that the feeling that we all have, the sense that we all have that life isn't the way it's supposed to be, that's actually one of the many proofs for the existence of God. Because here's what you got to understand. If there isn't a good, all-powerful God, then guess what you can't say? If God doesn't exist, then you can't say life should go this way. Why? Why should it? If God doesn't exist, then there's no such thing as should or shouldn't. It just is. If God doesn't exist, you can't call cancer bad. You can't call rape horrible. If God doesn't exist, then there's no morality and nothing's good or bad. Nothing is should or shouldn't. It just is. That's the best that an atheist can offer you, by the way. Life that just is. But the fact that we all have a sense that life isn't quite the way it's supposed to be, that points to the existence of a purpose giver. It points to the existence of one who has shaped life and given it meaning and ultimately one who can do something about it when life isn't going the way it should go. I think it also, that sense we have that there is a way life should go, I think that also points to the biblical reality that existence is, in fact, under a curse. In other words, the curse is why things aren't the way that we all sense life should be. Let's look at where the curse comes from here. This is in Genesis 3. It's going to be on the screen. You can follow along however you want to. Starts off right here, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Now, they there are these figures we call Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman. And to catch you up in the story, if you don't know it, they have just rebelled against the king of all creation, which, you know, we don't have kings. We have presidents and Congress and all that. But in a country with a king, if you rebel against the king, what happens to you? You're executed. Treason. You're a rebel. So Adam and Eve have just rebelled against the king. He gave them one instruction. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, that's where they find themselves. And they fall into, I'm going to call it anxiety. I'll explain why in just a little while. From a temptation that was given to them. And they choose to circumvent God. They choose to go around God. They try to find their own peace in life apart from God. And boom, everything falls apart. And so now they're hiding. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, good luck, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now before you say, well, if he's God, how could he not know where Adam is? He knows exactly where Adam is. Have you ever had someone that you care about in your life when you were making really bad decisions and they come up to you and they said, hey man, where's your head at right now? Where's your heart at right now? Where are you? 
Where are your feet planted? That's kind of what's happening here. It's a wake-up moment from God to Adam. Where are you? And then Adam responds. And I want you to pay attention to his response here. Because Adam and Eve, prior to this moment, their entire existence had been oriented towards God. They were not self-focused. That's most of our problem. Do you understand that? They were not self-focused. They were God-oriented, God-focused. It was about Him and how He loved and how He provided and how He created. And they were satisfied in Him. But once they gave in to anxiety, their orientation to God changes. And I want you to pay attention to the rhythm of how this one word comes up here in verse 10. Adam answered God, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This was a man that was God-focused. Now where is he focused? Self. I mean, that is sin in a nutshell. Your focus comes off of God and it goes to yourself. So right here in the beginning, we see the the real big effect of the curse. Human beings, rather than living a God-focused life, begin to live a self-focused life. And here's the great irony. We live a self-focused life because we think it'll give us the best life, and instead it gives us a cursed existence, marked by sins and sorrows. I, I. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, who told you that you were naked? He's like, I felt the breeze, right? (laughs) Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, again, God already knows what Adam has done. Do you remember when you were out on Friday night at a place you shouldn't have been with people you shouldn't have been with? And you were dumb enough to think that when you walked in that house, mom and dad wouldn't already know? Because, hello, you're in Jones County. Everybody knows, okay? (laughs) Okay. Preacher, don't tell anybody. I hate to tell you, five people came to me with it before you did, okay? They they know already. This is kind of that moment where God's going, so how did the evening go? He knew already. This was his moment to come clean. The man said, and here you go, women, you'll love this, the first example of blame blame shifting in a marriage. It happens right at the beginning, right? The man said, well, the woman whom you gave to be with me, so he immediately blames God and the woman rather than taking responsibility. She gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then she blame shifts. The woman said, the serpent implied that you created. If you wouldn't have made it, I'd have been fine. The serpent tricked me, and I ate. Interesting, because he did not trick her. He lied to her and tricked her. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, so here comes judgment for the rebellion. And even then, I want you to see this is mercy, because when you rebel against the king, what happens? You're executed. That doesn't happen here. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, say the word, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman. So suggesting that there was a state where there wasn't that like snake fear, which makes sense because I don't know of any woman that would let a snake get close enough to her ear to talk to her, right? There may be some. Some of you are insane with snakes. Shane, I've heard stories. I want proof, but I've heard stories, okay? But but something shifted there, right? So there'll be enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Interesting about this curse, the serpent is trying to elevate itself above God. Do you see that? It's trying to take over the role of God in the life of the man and woman. The serpent is lying about God. So how does the curse manifest for the serpent? You're trying to elevate yourself above me, so now you'll what? You'll crawl on your belly in the dust all the days of your life. And then to the woman, the Lord said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. Pangs is such a cute word, isn't it? Does pangs quite cut it, ladies? Yeah, yeah. I I, I don't know what word I would insert there, but not pangs. I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So it seems that pre-fall, the heartbeat of God is that husband and wife are what? totally equal and if we're going to be people who are living a pre-fall existence which is what we're called to as Christians that that guess what 
That's what we should be striving towards there. What's interesting to me, I, you know, some kids watch cartoons. I watch nature documentaries. It was back when National Geographic didn't have an agenda. It was just whales, right? It, it wasn't like, oh, and here's a transgender whale for da 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 It wasn't that. It was just... <laughs> It was just animals, and there was nothing weird about it. And, and, and one of the things I can clearly remember is the bear never seemed to be in great pain when it was giving birth. The wolves never seemed to be in great pain when they were giving birth. The gorilla never seemed to be in great pain when it was giving birth. The giraffe didn't seem to be in great pain when it was giving birth, though I'm sure falling six feet is problematic. But guess what one mammal in all the world really seems to have extreme, extreme pain in giving birth? Human female. I'm not saying there's a connection. I'm just saying one could see. One could see. And then to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. What's the implication there? You listen to her voice instead of mine. Guys, do not misuse that verse. I'm going to tell my wife. I don't have to listen to her anymore. <laughs> I, I do some marriage counseling. Not a professional. But here's the thing, right? I mean, Adam was the one whom the Lord told, don't eat from this. And it's clear that Adam told his wife because when the serpent comes to her with a lie, she says, hey, no, we're not supposed to do that. So she knows. But... Even though he knows the truth, because of whatever was inside of her started welling up inside of him. Have you ever noticed how anxiety can be contagious in a relationship? Right? Whatever's welling up inside of her begins welling up inside of him. And he chooses to listen to that voice instead of the voice of God. So because you listen to the voice of your wife and you've eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So you see a big shift there because they're in the garden and everything's provided and life is pretty easy and the ground is working the way it's supposed to until this moment. And suddenly the human's relationship with creation, of which we were supposed to be the good stewards, now our relationship with creation becomes somewhat antagonistic. Creation becomes wild, dangerous, unpredictable, unreliable, almost like life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. There you go. There's verse 3 of joy to the world. Thorns infest the ground. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. I've told you before, that's a phrase that in Hebrew means anxiety. That's a phrase that you would see when you were crossing a hill to fight your opponent and you thought your opponent had 500 troops but when you cross the hill you realize he has 10,000 troops and the sweat that then breaks out on your face of how in the world is it going to work? How are we going to make this happen? How is it going to be possible? Guys, any of you feel that in life? That's by the sweat of your brow, the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You were dust and to dust you will turn. That's the curse. It began with this active, intentional rebellion against God. And that one sin then flowed into all of humanity, growing at a rampant and reckless rate. And as it always does, as sin increased, so did sorrows, to the point that sin and sorrow became the state of human existence. I don't care what generation you are, if you think this world is broken and nothing seems to work the way it's supposed to, you got it right. Amen. Life is absolutely infested with thorns. Have you ever been at somebody's house, a beautiful summer day, they have a lush, immaculate lawn, and you're sitting outside and you decide to take off your shoes because what do we all want to do on amazing grass? Walk barefoot. And then you get five or six feet out into that yard and you realize that this yard has what we call in deep south Georgia, stickers. Y'all know stickers? I don't mean the stickers that my kids liked when they were little. I mean the kind that wreck your feet. And you sit down and then, oh no, I sat on one too. That's an adventure. And you get tweezers and your pocket knife trying to dig them out. The words are horrible. I hate thorns. My buddy Steve owns a quail hunting property in South Georgia where I'm from. And in order to go hunt there, you just know you're dealing with greenbrier. 
uh, the place is infested with greenbrier, and that's also why he has some wild quail. It's a give and take. But to go hunt there, to follow the dogs and to flush the birds, you can't even just put on double canvas front pants. You're putting on the full chaps as well. And even with that, you're at least three times going to get so caught and wound up in thorns that your buddy's going to have to come over and kind of help pull you out, cut you out. And even with all that padding on, at the end of the day, when you're stripping down to get in the shower, guess what your thighs are going to be? A bloody mess. A bloody mess. I mean, it's worth it, but a bloody mess. Thorns. Thorns make life miserable. And I can't think of a better metaphor for the current state of life than that line from verse 3, thorns infest the ground. But one of the things you need to understand about this curse is that God is not petty. Do you understand that? God, look, some of you think this, and I, I, don't, I want you to walk out the door thinking this ever again. God doesn't look at you and, and you sin, and so God goes, hey, I'm just going to blow up your life because you sinned. There are times where he will send things to get our attention, but God is not petty. God didn't look at Adam and Eve and say, oh, well, you disobeyed me, so I'm going to make your life chaos. That's not what God said. That's not what he did. God is life. Can you repeat that for me? God is life. God is order. God is purpose. So if God is life, order, and purpose, what happens when a human rejects God? Do you follow? Do you follow? The natural consequence, not God throwing a grenade, just the natural consequence of rejecting the one who is life, who is order, who is purpose, the natural consequence is that you begin to live a life that is disordered, that is purposeless, that is broken, that is filled with anxiety. That's just the natural consequence of it. And this story, the story of the curse, it really is an explanation of the true source of anxiety in our life. When the serpent tells Adam and Eve that God's holding out on you, that God doesn't really have your best interest at heart, that the only way to truly have life, Adam and Eve, is to go around God, to circumvent him. When the serpent tells them that, that little doubt sparks a fire of anxiety in Adam and Eve. What if the serpent is right? What if I don't take control? What if I don't go eat that? What if, what if, what if? How many of you know the what ifs? Look, we, we, we really believe a lot in this church in confession. We really stress to everybody in this church getting into a small group with other believers where you can hold each other accountable and pray for each other. Uh, I'm in one of those groups. Many others are. If you're interested, see Tori in the back. Wave, Tori. There you go. Yeah. you, you got to be in some area like that if you really want to grow in Jesus. But I'll tell you guys, I've been drowning in the what-ifs for about two months just drowning in them. So when I'm preaching this and I'm sharing this, guys, I know this. This is not, oh, well, the preacher doesn't have to experience real life. I know this stuff, and I know the feelings, and I know where it takes you in your mind. And so here's Adam and Eve, and they're, they're drowning in what if and what if and what if, and before long, Adam and Eve get consumed by their what ifs, by their anxiety, and we know, we know they're consumed by it, because it begins to manifest itself in actions. And what's their action? They reject God, and they try to take control of their own life. They try to escape anxiety by going around God. One of the great lies in our very lost society is that God and Christian morality are repressive and restrictive and only once you reject God and Christian morality, only when you set yourself free from those things, can you truly find expressive freedom in life. You understand that's not a new idea, right? That's exactly what the serpent told Adam and Eve. It goes all the way back to the garden. The world tells us that moving past God will set you free from the anxiety that you carry. But the word of God tells us that 
Only by being in a relationship with Jesus can we be saved from an anxiety-driven life. Life apart from God is not freedom. It's slavery to anxiety. Life apart from God is a cursed existence. It's only when we live between the guardrails of his law and his love that we can truly experience freedom in life. Only the one who made you, only the one who gave you purpose, only the one who has called you to him can truly deal with the root causes of anxiety in your life. Here's what I want you to hear this morning, and then we're going to close. So, Melissa, if you want to head back up pretty soon. Your heavenly Father loves you so much that while you were tangled up in the thorns, while you were wrapped up in sin and sorrow, He sent His only eternal Son to rescue you from the curse, to rescue you from the thorns, to rescue you from the sin and sorrow of your life. And here's how He did it. Jesus did it by taking your place. You know that scene at the crucifixion when the crown of what? Thorns is pressed onto his head. In his flesh, Jesus took on the thorns of the curse. He took on the sins and sorrows of the world. And Jesus, as he's carrying that, as he's carrying your anxiety in his flesh to the cross, and then he's nailed to the cross, guess what else is being nailed to the cross? The curse, your anxieties, your sins, and your sorrows. And when Jesus dies, guess what those things do too? They die as well. One of the things I want you to know this morning is the only life your anxiety can have is the life you allow it to have. Because the truth of it is that it's been carried to the cross in Jesus. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. For those of you who are here this morning and you are drowning in anxiety, I'd love to pray with you at the altar. Kibby, you can keep playing if we have people at the altar. You're a professional. You've got that, right? Yeah. I'd love to just pray with you. You can pray in your seat. That's just as valid. But if you'd like somebody praying with you, I'm going to come over here to this section and I would love to just pray over you. For those of you who are here this morning and you have felt like your life is cursed, like nothing goes the way it's supposed to, nothing works the way it's supposed to, and you have yet to become a follower of Jesus. You've yet to invite him into the sins and sorrows of your life. You've yet to be baptized into his death and resurrection. I'll be very honest with you, and every Christian in here will as well. Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean things suddenly start going right. Amen? But what it does mean is you begin to understand why things are the way they are and you begin to face them with a hope that you've never had before because you know that the one who is in you is stronger than anything that the world can send your way. If you have not given yourself to Jesus, then you are still under a curse. And Jesus is a curse breaker. And I want you to meet him this morning. If that's you... The Lord's calling you to that. Come find me up here. I want to talk to you before you leave about following Jesus. And I want to talk to you about your next steps in being a disciple as well. Let's pray. And then we'll sing our closing carol together. And again, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ the curse is broken. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, even when our life goes sideways, that doesn't rule us. It doesn't define us. It doesn't have power over us. We are in Christ. And because of him, we can experience the blessings of knowing and loving and following him in a life and in a place where the curse used to be prolific. God, I pray this morning in a way that only you can do by the Holy Spirit, would you give some people here who are drowning in anxiety 
would you give them some relief? Would that relief be more of Jesus? For those of us who are carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders and we think that everything depends upon us and we think that we got to get it right and be perfect all the time or it's all just about to fall apart, for those of us that are feeling that, Jesus, give us the gift of peace this morning. And for those of us who are sick and tired of life just being cursed all the time, but we haven't bent the knee to Jesus yet, God, would you give them the courage to have a real honest prayer with you this morning to give themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Our closing hymn is in your hymnals on page 246. We'll sing Joy to the World and we'll sing all three verses. So please stand and join me. As we spend Christmas Eve with our family and friends, let us remember to stay God-focused and not self-focused. Let us remember that Jesus came to rescue us from the curse of anxiousness, and may we live in a right relationship with God. Merry Christmas 